sometimes it does take a moment. No, we are recording. Alex, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm doing amazing. Like, uh, like I said, it's um, living the dream. I'm here. I'm with you today, and I can't wait to have a great conversation. Um, so, you are you started Atlas Wine Company, yeah? Yeah. Um, what? Why did you start the company? Like, what? What was your goal? <laughs> well, it's a uh, it's it's a uh, it's a deep question because. Uh, so I, I like to to uh, um, go back a little bit. So because my story, I think from the beginning, sort of led me to Atlas Wine Company. Um, I, I'm a food science engineer, so I did a master's degree in South of France in food science, uh, which is basically making ketchup to chocolate to coffee. Um, I specialize in in chocolate, which I loved, and um, my last internship was in uh, studying the packaging of wine and its impact on the flavors of wine. So for example, a lot of people think screw cap is a uh, cheaper wine, uh, not as effective as a cork, but I did a scientific study uh, on why it could be good or not good as well as synthetic corks, you know, those plastic corks. Uh, and that was my first experience with the wine business and absolutely fell in love with, you know, the the depth of the science, the um, the diversity of the industry, uh, uh, compared to making ketchup, it was like a, a dream come true, right? So, yeah. uh, uh, but in a way, I didn't study enology. Enology is the science of wine or wine making, which is a a, um, a a special university you need to do. So what I did is I took my backpack and I start washing tanks in uh, New Zealand. And the beauty is I, I did what we call traveling winemaker, which is I, I jump from country to country, learns through harvest, uh, the, you know, all the trade stuff, and then uh, became a winemaker um, like that. I came to the U.S., um, settled down with my family, and uh, I became a consultant, which I, I help other wineries to for some problems. And some of my uh, clients were like Opus One, Gallo, Constellation, Keno Jackson, so the big guys. Uh, and, you know, found the, the US industry, wine industry, absolutely amazing, tons of opportunity. But one thing that strikes me and through my consulting years is like, people don't want to change. There is a resistance of change all the time. And um, as a consultant, I really wanted to make things move. And I found that it was a patience, like you needed a lot of patience. So I started Atlas Wenko in order to kickstart my ideas and say, okay, if, if those guys don't want to listen to what I want to do, I'm going to do it. And when I started the company, what I found is 97% of the wines consumed in the United States are under $20 retail. Uh, and those wines are made in big majority by 50 corporations, Gallo being number one. And uh, from there, I decided there were not a lot of choices available under $20 retail. So what I did is I reverse engineered the price point, uh, went all the way down from the distributor, the account, I mean, the grocery store, all that, and said, what kind of budget, what kind of, of money I can to make a $20 wine and, and provide an alternative to mass produced wine that is crafted, clean, and, and so I started the brand in the purpose of making an affordable craft product with high quality in mind, because most of those wines are sold by the sub $20 are, are sold by those big corporations. So the, the consumer on itself doesn't have a lot of choices. So here's my question for the average wine consumer who's used to buying those brands. And I don't want to name names, but you know they're they're owned by Gallo Constellation, the whole you know the, the biggest yep. companies around. Um, yep. What is going to be the biggest difference, like in terms of their drinking experience? Like, I I like to think that there is a very noticeable, distinct difference in quality here. Yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to convey to people. <laughs> but the, the the if you look at the budget to make a twenty dollar bottle of wine, what you find out is you. You, you grape source things or wherever you get the stuff on the cost of making wine, which is, is, is high, is very high. 
And the margins in wines are much lower than in spirits. For example, for spirits, you can, you know, 200% margin, the product doesn't go bad. Wine is a vintage product, meaning every year you have to manage the differences, the changes via the climate, some of that. Um, and you have to plan for next year or two years ahead, depending on how long you age. So sub $20, you are sort of handcuffed in your process and how you make the wine. So the big companies that say, you know, we're gonna focus on marketing the wine a little more than we will focus on the quality of the wine. And that comes down to the fact that you could make better wine at 20 bucks, but it requires a very high um, a level of expertise. And also it's much harder and because the United States as a market is sort of a uh, new market, meaning people have been drinking wine less at times than in Europe, for example, the education of the people uh, tends to have a sweeter palate. So instead of making your wine better, they're gonna try to use additives like sugar, uh, mouse feeders, or anything like that that will make the product extremely seductive at first, and then sort of becoming a little like, eh. It's a little bit, I, I, I call it the fast food, you know, that, that Big Mac or that, that uh, crispy chicken sandwich, the first bite you want it, right? But then when you're done with the burger, you're like, ah, that, that, that's, it's, it's lacking something. So what you're gonna find in my wine is that it's, a, it's also a burger, right? We, we, we're selling the same thing, but mine is made from a local, you know, um, you know, butcher and he has a little more depth. It doesn't get you, you know, as much that weird chemical feeling. So it's all about going back to the basics. And, you know, in France, the industry, and it, it's normal wine costs more here because just like you take the cost of the land in the US, it's very high. In France, most of the domain, the chateau, the estates, they've been owning their land for, you know, generation on lands. So you don't have to factor that cost as much. So the pure value, which is price uh, ratio with the quality is a much more challenge in a new coming country because I think the Napa Valley was really striving in the 60s. You know, it's like with 1960s, it's like it's our parents' generation. Uh, where in France, you're talking centuries. And, uh, and so in that matters, the price but, and I want to make very uh, like a strong point is that the climate in California is extremely beneficial to grape growing. So you get very good grapes or at least the medium are very, very good. So what happened is winemaker tends to be a little more lazy, good ripeness, and then put on a lot of marketing and that's it. It's exactly what happened in the beer. The beer industry did not change for years you know but like cause light they didn't change then the craft beer arrived and everything changes because now quality is in the center the same with coffee before starbucks the coffee in the united states was you, you could not drink it and people yeah. says not good but try what was sold in the 80s <laughs> i mean that's and and so you always need those disruptor to quality of product only comes from competition is the same, Apple versus Microsoft, Tesla versus Ford, whatever you say, you need that challenge. And the wine business in California has not been challenged as much as it should, because what the big guy does is they bought the little guys that try to challenge them and that's it. So there's been a lot of purchase and, and that's what's happening. So I'm here to sort of make my point and say, hey, you need the bridge between a menage a trois wine, which is a, a bomb of sugar, uh, non varietal meaning the wine, Merlot, Cabernet, Syrah, Red Blend, sort of taste to a varietal wine where they are different or to a Chateau Neuf du Pape or something, you know, a, a more iron product. But someone needs to do that bridge between, and Lagunitas, for example, for beer did it, you know, they made it from, you know, an IPA and now people go, oh, Lagunitas is an everyday IPA. I'd rather have that small craft brewery in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Right. That's entirely true. Um, and what I really appreciate is what you've done with it's most readily apparent to me anyway, with the single vineyard Orobello Chardonnay. Yeah, because you have the this I okay, 
no offense. I have to be honest with you, though. This is not my yeah. favorite wine. Yeah. Just so There's we know. The the regular Chardonnay, the the yeah. you put it as, you know, light oak and creamy. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And I love yeah. how detailed and actually useful the back label is on your products because mostly um, it's just marketing on everything else. Like this is like this tells you the fact that you list the pH is yeah. like, thank you. Like, I love that. Yeah. Um. But with your with the single vineyard with the fallen leaf, like you can very easily look. You spend twice the amount of money, roughly, right? It's mm -hmm. not that much of a difference. It's like ten or fifteen dollars on the shelf. Yeah. But like, if you like this, and then like you can actually compare what the difference is with with a single vineyard stuff. What other products do you have where that is in there? Because all I know about is your red blend and the Pinot Noir. Yeah. So so the the idea is is. You know, you want to compete in Samfield. And I'm, I'm going to tell you a story that I found extremely relevant. Uh, one of my best friends uh, just opened a brewery about four or five years ago. And his first thing when he opened his brewery is like, I'm not making any IPAs. Right. The brewers, they don't want to brew IPAs. They find it boring um, and they want to do Pilsners. They want to do sour beers or whatever. I say, hey, dude, you got to make an IPA. Because it's eighty percent of the sales at the tap room, and I said, "No, I don't want that." So, uh, short story: six months after he opened, it's like I brew my first IPA, and so far, eighty percent of all these sales is an IPA, right? So, uh, so my program is based on the best seller wine, which is a Chardonnay, a Cabernet Sauvignon, a red blend, and a Pinot Noir. Those are the four top variators in the U.S. in sales. Okay. And the profile of my red blend, the profile of my Chardonnay matches the profile that people want to drink, which is uh, popcorn Chardonnay, oaky, buttery, easy going, no need for food, but I don't have residual sugar. And I put Sonoma fruit in order to elevate the palate with instead of increasing butteriness, I highlight the, the acidity. And my goal is to educate people. My goal is to be the bridge between a commercial wine with residual sugar to a Sancerre, which is, you know, top Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc. And the challenge with that is you need to start where you cut the customer is at. And my regular Chardonnay is where the customer is at. My single vineyard Chardonnay, no oak, no malolactic. The malolactic is a secondary fermentation that provides the crispiness of the acidity to a more rich buttery uh, uh, acidity is from malo malic acid to lactic lac lactic acid and that gives that creaminess but that creaminess also uh, removes some of the minerality which is the saltiness of the wine as well as some fruitiness so my single vineyard chardonnay which is the ingredients i'm using in my regular chardonnay 20 percent of my regular chardonnay has that wine in it it's extracted to highlight, hey, here's the raw ingredient. No winemaking, no oak, no malolactic, no tricks. Here's the pure product you're going to find. That's great. The grapes, the vineyard is just expressing itself. Now, those wines are not for everyone, but that's the next step, you know. And so on my red blend, I have a single vineyard Barbera. I have a single vineyard Syrah Viognier. Uh, I have a... Um, a single vineyard Cabernet, uh, organic grapes from the Futiers. Rorik? And... Yeah. Was that the Rorik one? Okay, exactly. that one I've tasted. I love that one. Yes. And so the idea, like the back label, the idea is I need to find a compromise between the people that study wine and really wants to see my craft and the everyday consumer. So when I put on my red blend, pear grapes with burger, you know, if you're a chef, you're like, oh, yeah, whatever. But if you're someone that every day and you have a bunch of friends and it's supposed to have July and you want to barbecue, you take burger, guys. Who doesn't love burgers, right? And then you have the pH and you have all the details of the varietal and that someone that is into wine, your friends invite you and they have omen at the table where you pick up that bottle of wine and it's like, ah, my friend never chose good wine. And you start looking at it and it's like, oh, that wine has more to it than what it looks like. So the experts find something that they like and the everyday 
uh, why beginners also find. So it's finding that right balance between not being nerdy and being ac accessible. So. But hey, look, I, I do love me some nerdiness though. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it, it's, you know, and it's all what we do on everything. And right now, for example, I launched my new Omen Origins Infantile, which is a $16 wine on the shelves, very affordable. And it's just a pure zin from the food ears. And that tends to be even more approachable than my red blend. So I'm really going through the spectrum of beginner to advance and hopefully find something that can educate. The only thing we really care at Atlas in general is to have people like, we do 100% satisfaction guaranteed on all our wine. What does that mean? Is if you don't like your wine, I will pick up the phone and I will advise you through your palate which wine you should drink because at the end of the day, like a running shoes, that's not because the shoes is bad, it's because you choose the wrong one for you. And wine is very, people, I mean, they've been telling me, oh, I really don't like Syrah, I don't really like Syrah. And it's like, yes, you do. You just don't choose the right one. <laughs> and Chardonnay, I mean, my, my um, foreign leaf Chardonnay is, you know, night and day compared to my regular Chardonnay. And if someone says, I don't like Chardonnay, but well, they actually may like the foreign leaf because it's a Chablis style, much more acidic, much more like a Sauvignon brand a bit, right? It's Burgundy. So. It's California Burgundy. And that's what I love. Like, this rack is all Burgundy, basically. This is white burgundy. This is red burgundy. Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are what I do. And it's like, it's not, it doesn't have to be like that syrupy, sickly, sweet Syrah Pinot Noir. Like this is a hundred percent Pinot Noir. Is it not? Sorry. I was pointing at dark. Yeah. For yeah. A second. yeah. We, we don't, we don't do any tricks and it's hundred percent. Our cabinet does have a little bit of Syrah and Petit Syrah. Uh, but again, that's, um, you know, Pinot Noir is, the hardest grapes to blend. Why? <laughs> it's it's just very finicky. Uh, so like yeah, the, the 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 reason is it's very easy to oxidize. Um, he has a balance of tannins on color. So every wine is sort of like a a molecule, right, or whatever, like uh, something. So it's all balanced between its tannins, which is the dryness, the chalkiness, and its color. So. Each tannins can only take that much color with it, all right, unbound. So every wine, like Cabernet Sauvignon, is very well balanced in colors and tannins, but Pinot Noir has very low color and very low tannins. So it's a very challenge. So if, for example, you will put uh, Petit Verdot with, um, with uh, Pinot Noir, it won't blend at all because their ratio tannins versus color is very, very different to the Pinot. And it's even challenging to blend Pinot together. So when I went to Burgundy, I went to their thing. There's two rules in, in Burgundy that I found that are absolutely amazing. First, they never open the barrels. So when the wine goes in aging, they put a bang over it and never touch it, okay? Most winemakers, they will call topping, meaning they're gonna replenish the barrels a little bit, or they're gonna rack and clean the wine between three to eight times before bottling. In Burgundy, they barely touch it. The reason is they don't want to oxidize the wine. The second thing is they blend their Pinot way early between, before bottling. Uh, meaning three or four months before bottling, they will combine all their Pinot lot in order to recreate a, um, something that sort of mixed together. A Cabernet, mm -hmm. you don't need to do it that long. But Pinot Noir, because it's so tricky, you really have to do it wear it and even though Pinot Noir tends to suffer a lot of bar shock meaning that when you borrow the wine the wine just get muted meaning it doesn't get a, have a lot of aromatics it, it's sort of like it's sort of like neutral and so it's very important I mean one of the Burgundy producer even put music be on the bottom of the tank to help with the <laughs> with the with the uh with the blending and getting that sort of molecular symbiosis going on and and so Pinot Noir to me you don't blend it and if you do you can do it at the fermentation meaning before the wine is transformed into wine and that will work uh, people do that to secure their more color but that's about your only chance raise right there wow that's crazy
<laughs> I like I I the more I learn about Burgundy, the more I'm like, oh my god, this is it's just it's a magical place. I haven't been yeah. yet. I I need to visit. Yeah, it's uh my my favorite is Syrah. I think Syrah is one of the because uh, Pinot Noir is really uh it's it's not that versatile. It's really the vineyards bring you a grape, and the goal of the winemaker is to take it with tweezers and absolutely not mess. Uh, where Syrah, he has, I mean, when I went in, in Tan Hermitage and in Australia, I saw the Syrah is the most diverse grape that there is. You can have Syrah from white paper, extremely acidic, almost like a Pinot, to a Zinfandel-like uh, grapes. And it's just so, and you can co-ferment it with white wine, like a Viognier, like a Cote Roti style. So me, that's my, um, I really like because it's sort of like, uh, a blank canvas every time where Pino, it tells you already what kind of art it is. And, <laughs> and it, you, you don't have a say on it. <laughs> There's not much room for the winemaker. Well, it, it is. It, the, the, the rules is in the vineyard and you see the best Pinot producers are vineyards work. Like they are people from the vineyards. And if you have bad vineyards in Pinot, it's, it's no chance you're gonna make a good wine. So. Damn. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just crazy. I um. I I so why Omen? That's what I wanted to ask you. Why Omen and why or Orobello? I think is pretty fairly evident. Unless yeah. there, there's uh, something so a little bit. It, so the, the idea is it is like again I'm I'm trying to reach the consumer right and there's one thing I noticed in America since I arrived here is in France, we, you know, we have families and all of that. But if you look at the best wines in the world, they are brands, right? And people think putting your name or becoming a brand on your name is possible. But the idea was really to create a brand and get inspired by the spirits on the beer industry. So I wanted to create Omen because I wanted to be something edgy. Uh, because, you know, it's very trendy to not go in that white label with the cursive and another one with a heavy paper stock and a navy bar. So I wanted some things that was outside the box. Um, you know, I'm extremely inspired by Banksy, by, uh, you know, the street culture. And when that actually, it's a monastery that on, a, on top of a vineyard uh, that we took a picture of, and we just got that that just share presence and then we found the name omen that stick with it because we need brand names that was short easy to to tell but the bottom line is we wanted to create a brand and that brand will um will relay the fact that it's good quality that is trusted that we are leader in transparency that um you know i mean you take um uh, some coffee brands are very much like that nowadays and the, the most people start a wine with the vineyard. We started a wine program with a brand and a price point. And, and that's where I came as a little more original as a winemaker because I really say, okay, what do you want to drink? You want a Chardonnay? Let me make it for you. And I, I went down that way because at the end of the day, I would make, if I were to make the wine I drink, you know, it, they will be different. Um, not the single vineyards. I really like those wines. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I grew up in France. My palate, my story is very different than anyone else I said in Nebraska or in New Jersey. And just that's the fact. And, and as of today, we really need to listen to the consumer uh, because, and, and, and the only reason I didn't point out if you have a budget of $40 or plus in the United States, if you have, you're ready to spend $40 or more in a bar of wine, your choices of amazing wines are endless, okay? I have friends that make the most beautiful wine. I can drop them left and right. What do you want when people come to Napa Valley? You should go there, it's absolutely. But those wines are not budget friendly for everyone. And what I notice is above 40 bucks, you have a lot of good wines, but under 20, it was becoming more rare. So what people do, they tend to buy French wine or they tend to buy Malbec from Argentina because they actually better value, even though they come from 
you know, another country. And to me, that's why I'm so motivated to make something change is because I want to be, um, you know, helping people to grow on their, uh, you know, their, their wine journey. And, and that's come with education. One thing that is very interesting is I never give tasting notes. Never. And people are like, bon, why do you describe the wine? It's like, I don't do that. Your palate, your expression. Tell me what you uh, experience. But the tasting notes on itself are very tricky because everyone has a different palate. And everyone has a different palate history. Meaning, see, if I say, oh, that wine is full of cherry, are you talking about a cherry, the fruit, or are you talking about the cherry pie, which is completely different? One is very sweet, rich, and the other one is, is fresh, right? So, um, so those are the kind of things, re-educating people, uh, going on their level, talking with the world they know. Wine is not, it should be fun, right? We, we talk about Star Wars and you have the Obi-Wan Kenobi. I mean, uh, one of the best tasting I ever done was to compare my wines to uh, fantasy animals or fantasy like science fiction characters. It's like, you know, my Chardonnay is like, you know, Princess Leia. Oh, I want to try Princess Leia, right? It's like, <laughs> and- uh, Can we and... do that? What's, what are the rest of them? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, so my red blend is definitely, um, you know, my red blend is Iron Man. There is no question about that. Mm. It's like, full on. Uh, self like um, super uh, self confident person, tons of alcohol, fifteen point five percent alcohol. I want to show off. That's you know the red blend is easy. It's a uh, it's a uh, the um, the Cabernet Sauvignon. It's it's more for it's more for classic. I would say that's Obi Wan Kenobi. It's like it's 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 quiet. It's strong, but it's also you know he has that some that of like. Uh, more like it's not that fruity all the time so he has like a little bit of those earthy notes so it's a classic right so let's put the cabernet sauvignon as that um you know the the pinot noir is definitely carol wren because it's completely conflicted right it's like the pinot noir you open it one day is on the good side you open it on another day it's on the bad side i mean that's that's just classic pinot uh, I would even look at the moon. Some, some days I try my pinot. I'm like, what is that? And the other day I was like, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> okay. So, so no, this is really important. Is, yeah. Do you believe at all in, cause I'm like a huge believer in the biodynamic calendar and how it affects how a wine shows. Like people think I'm crazy, yeah. but like, it's a real thing. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know the exact. Yeah, yeah it is. a. So uh, you, own sensitivity to stuff like you take allergies but some days uh, a very good example is some days you drive by a bakery shop and have that on you like i need it it smells so good so you um you uh like your sensitivity to aromatics and to every day to your mood are you anxious are you stressed are you uh you know very calm everything changes is it linked to a biodynamic calendar on the moon and all that perhaps but what i found is like some days I will have 50 samples of wine. I need to do my blending, right, for my bottling. It's a very important day. And I taste the first one. I say, okay, we wrap it up. We don't do it today. I don't have it. In general, my um, senses are much better in the morning than in the afternoon. Wow. Uh, so, like, for example, it, like, coffee is really, like, it's, it's a, and so you really have to uh, listen to yourself. So some days, Food would just not taste right, uh, and it, it's just depending on very a lot of factors. But it's definitely in wine, especially in in, in tasting. If you were to dive into it, there is days like like some people tell me, "Oh, I really didn't like that wine." It's like, "Well, did you like anything that day?" For example, it's like, "Oh, no, not really." It was like, "Well, try it, perhaps tomorrow." <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it could have been true when you say, "Oh, that Chardonnay was not my favorite." It's like you may have like a bad news or something, and you. You, like it's really wine is a sensory experience on steroid, right? There is more than 5,000 aromatics in a glass of wine. It's the most complex aromatic product in the world. So when you're not into it and you weren't ready to dig into it, it could be overwhelming. It could be also in a way, not such a good experience, but it could be also one of the most amazing experience. So, um, I've been a true believer that, you know, make sure that you drink and people always like a wine when they have fun. 
right? That's that's, that's something. <laughs> so, uh, so you, you know, always consider, you know, wine is about being with friends, is about community and all of that. And and people will say, you know, like why rose is so popular? Because you drink always, always rose in fun places, the pool, barbecue, and uh, outside when it's summer, it's like, yeah, I want to drink rose. But do you want to be by the pool or you really want to drink rose? Which one is it? And so, um, you know, it's all about, uh, I think, matching your expectation and the right product and make sure that that product is creative as well. But, um, you know, a way to describe wine with uh, a character is just a way to close the, the gap between my technicality, the, what I know as a winemaker and the consumer, right? It's just a way to explain to them, you know, if the Pinot Noir is scarred or ran and say, oh yeah, I really, I really see those like mushroomy tastes. And it's like, well, that's the dark side of it. But I really taste that cherry. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the good side of it, right? And people, instead of being like, oh, I don't like mushrooms, they say, oh, I get it. The Pinot Noir is double face. He has, you know, because Pinot is like that. And, and I said, well, now take a thin crust pizza with white mushrooms on it and, you know, a white base and like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, now I get it. And, uh, and so it, it's all about finding a common ground to explain stuff, basically. Wow. That's insane. Like, <laughs> you, you have been able to articulate something that like I, I've kind of been stumbling around peripherally, but like that's. That's amazing. Um, can we? Oh, where can people find your wines? Yeah, but so um, the, the you know your local wine shop. I mean, we are distributed in thirty five states. Um, I'm saying that, of course, we have a website. Of course, you can buy on our website. It's atlaswineco.com. But the bottom line, as everything is, trust your local wine shop because. Even you think you're gonna pay two or three dollars more per bottle, which is not necessarily true, you're gonna get someone that is very passionate about wines that's gonna guide you through your journey. And so, you know, our wines could be always found in, in, in small wine shop. You can ask me, send me an email. So if you go to atlaswineco.com, so A T L A S W I N E C O.com, uh, any email goes straight to me and say, hey, I live in, in Connecticut and where can I find you wine? Now I will guide you straight. Uh, you, the, the reason I'm pushing for people to go to their local wine shop is to create uh, you know, a relationship with someone that understand what you're looking for in wine. And if you look, you have the product that match what you're looking for, you uh, gonna have a good experience. Meaning that the money you spend in wine is gonna be fully, uh, you know, it's going to be added value. And that's really what's the bummer right now. Is a lot of people drink wine and they drink the wrong wine and they say, that was expensive and it was not even good. You really got to go somewhere where someone can help you. And the beauty is there's so many good, so many of those small wine shops that are very passionate, you know, what you're doing, even go to you and ask for advice. And, you know, I tried that wine. Is there anything else I should try? I see that you know, uh, with your website to try to guide people. And it's really about being curious and never be afraid of asking a question. There's no bad questions. Um, and, uh, you know, all our wines out there, you, we have tons of information um, just for people with diet restriction. All our wines are keto, paleo, gluten-free, vegan-friendly. And the reason is because we put our ingredients and the ingredients are grape, yeast, oak, and a little bit of sulfide. That's it. And all our sulfites are lower than the organic standard, meaning that they are under 100 ppm. So if you think you have a reaction to sulfites, uh, you know, our wines doesn't have that much. But the bottom line in general is wine doesn't have a lot of sulfites compared to other products. Uh, drinking in moderation, extremely important. It's two drinks a day for a man, one for a woman in general. Uh, you know, in your wine journey, most of my wine can last easily a week in the fridge. The temperature is the biggest problem of a wine going bad. Uh, you can buy fancy tools and all of that, but the bottom line is you open a glass, you serve a glass, you put it back on a refrigerated place because warm temperature increase oxidation of the wine. 
but when it's cold, it stops all the chemical process. So you're ready. I mean, most of my wines are open for weeks in the fridge. So you don't need to finish a bottle of wine. Um, you know, if you drink three or four glasses and you think there's too much sulfites on your wine, I mean, it's because you drink three or four glasses. Um, <laughs> there's no answer to that. Uh, and if you want low alcohol, we have that new product. It's Orbital Light. It's like a you know, 9% alcohol wine, which is great for just, you know, having a glass tonight and just also alcohol will dehydrate you. So you have to drink a plenty of water with it and uh, eat a proper diet with not too much salt. And I mean, there's a lot of things to it, but I drink a glass or two a day and um, I'm a ultra marathon. I do, uh, you know, I do mountain biking every day and uh, I'm in great shape. So <laughs> it's a great way to stay in shape. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> after the do you advocate for putting red uh in the fridge as well yeah mm -hmm. okay so what i do it, it just it helps the wine like a cabernet sauvignon can go almost eight to nine days so what i do is most people like to have their wine in their kitchen but be careful that's extremely dangerous because that's where the heat source are which is you know your stove or your oven uh, or your coffee machines, or your water heater, whatever that is. So when you put a glass of red, uh, the the you know you keep it stored in the dark, right? Somewhere cool in your house, and you open the bar wine, you serve yourself a glass or two glasses that day. Then you put it in the fridge. The day after, what I do is I take a glass, I put it on the counter, take the bottle of the fridge, serve myself a glass, leave it for 15, 20 minutes out like that get it back to um, regular temperature. And that's how I serve my wines. Um, that will be the best. Uh, most bread should last two or three days in the corner, but do not put it next to its source. That will damage the wine in no time. So um, so yes, I put my reds in the fridge as well, uh, if I wanted to keep it for a week or so. Okay. Wow. That's a good tip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that one down. There we I go. I've not been doing that, but I will now. And um, or, or uh, just as a note, most people drink their wine way too warm. Also, be careful. I we put the the serving temperature. I mean, um, I like to have my house on the chill side because I'm I don't like global warming, so I don't use. But my red wine here for the red blend is between 63 and 69 degrees. Uh, you know, Fahrenheit. And you know, a lot of people like to have their house at 70 in the winter. And that's already too warm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, keep in mind that, you know, uh, wine on the 60s is pretty, it's a good temperature. The first thing you will notice in a very, very nice restaurant is the wines always have a slight chill and that's where you should drink it. And that's why, you know, there's fancy wine fridge. They actually keep it a little lower, which um, is good. Um, and But you can manage that with your own regular fridge as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite pairing for... for your wines what do you yes like to, what's your favorite yep. pairing friends ah uh, i love that i love it <laughs> friends I love uh it. i mean it's all about sharing wine has been there it's 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 sharing it's spending good time with people it's putting a smile on your face uh there is every the rosé can go with red meat the chardonnay can go it's it, there's tons of things i mean if you go to a five the, the french laundry a very nice restaurant and you have a sommelier guys through to like one of the most amazing culinary experience of your life you could do that but on an everyday basis you know you just the only thing that wines really don't like is spicy food and you tend to have a sweet wine but in general if you eat spicy food uh, wine is not really that good of a, of, <laughs> of a fit uh you know, um, you know, friends, Netflix, Star Wars, you know, anything, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's the answer of life, right? It's, it just put a big smile on your face. It's, uh, as I say, 5,000 plus aromatics in a glass of wine It's one of the most finest product in the world it has been made since ages ago. And you are just basically drinking history and it's like still a very pure, pure, agricultural cultural products there's a story behind it there's passion i did people behind it so you know just sharing with friends is always the best pairing with me i second that um, <laughs> can we talk about star wars a little bit sure all right uh so are you so you are caught up with the mandalorian yes i am okay. yeah 
So, uh, spoilers for The Mandalorian. There you spoilers. go. <laughs> um, Luke Skywalker appears in in the finale. So, are you going to rewatch the films now? And what was your first experience with Star Wars? Uh, yeah. So my, my first experience was in France, obviously on the on the on the basics when the first three arrived, which is number four, five, six, right? Um, and I always took them as action movie, right? It's like, oh yeah, it's gonna be action movies, and and I, you always have that friend from you know that loved Lord of the Rings and all those movies. Is they they binge watching Star Wars again, looking for details and all that. So I was never right there. Um, I really love the the new ones uh, that Disney came up with. You know, one of the the best movie. I mean, really, what what brought me back to the Star Wars franchise was Rogue One. I really found that movie to be absolutely like wow well, i could not just i needed to watch it like entirely and my full attention uh, and then the Mandalorian happened and you know he came and i really liked the storyline and it was good season one but the season two really blow like it was like, when i finished season two took a subscription on disney plus and rewatched all of them in the order every single one of them to get every single detail on jabadia on you know, because at first I saw the Mandalorian was Boba Fett. I saw Baby Yoda was Baby Yoda. And I'm like, I'm trying to put everything together. I'm like, there's still so many questions I need answers. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's it's been um, my experience with it now. Um, definitely went from action movie, go on your IMAX, like, uh, you know, like ride to a big fan on reading on, on everything I could about the storyline. and. I'm uh, very excited about uh, what they're going to come up with. I think it's only the beginning, really. <laughs> Do you, uh, what character did you identify with most? Uh, I, you know, you have Obi-Wan Kenobi there, right? Okay. That, <laughs> I mean, for me, it, I'm, I'm old enough that that's really, truly what I think. I mean, it, it's the storyline. I mean, every single character sort of fit from that conflicted personalities that I want to save the world. I'm also attracted by the dark side, but at the end of them, a good guy. It's uh, to me, it's as a true hero because it's not that fancy, he struggles, but he's also, I mean, that's, that's you know, I really like, um, you know, Anakin, very hard for me to, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan, but yeah, Obi-Wan by far is 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 uh you know and luke skywalker i guess you know um you know those two characters are definitely the for me um uh, you know very important on the on the top list right and I, I like the new girl too you know she's she's great too so i guess i i like the new the, the jedi that saves everyone at the end <laughs> will be one um yeah it's good stuff and of course chewbacca <laughs> oh yes he's the best co-pilot like how could you, how could yeah, you not? yeah you want to be the and that's that's the guy he's gonna stick with you no matter what so you know i'm a bit of a shuba guy that's why i have a beard you know it's, that's my tribute to him <laughs> that is awesome um i've actually been uh so for me star wars is more of like a spiritual thing yeah do you do, are you like spiritual at all do you like is that something you buy into? Yeah, I mean, I, I buy into everything. I'm extremely open-minded. You know, I grew up in France. Uh, I live in the United States. I travel in many countries. I love being outside. I love just sit, staring at the stars or whatever. So it's like, to me, I'm, I'm a sponge. If someone's into something, I'm going to listen. I'm going to take their side, you know. Will I practice anything on my side? I mean, my, my, I have my, my own way to deal with stuff, but the, the, yeah, I'm completely open to anything already. All right. So this what's is, your, um, uh, what's your, your thumbs up? What's, what makes Star Wars spiritual for you? Oh, like the, the whole, like, so, um, the whole concept of the Jedi, like yeah. the Jedi code and applying that to to because when you when you when you strip Star Wars of its fiction like the whole philosophy of the force it's it's really taoist and buddhist yeah. right there's like this field that unifies everything i love that the mantras yeah. that that the jedi code are like you know 
uh, tempering emotion and passion and stuff like that. Because if you get angry and you allow your emotions, you, there's power to be had from the dark side. So I, I appreciate the lessons. I think it's really yeah. valuable. Excellent. Well, yes, that's, uh, I mean, I'm totally into that. I mean, for me, you know, my thing is nature. I love to be out. I love, you know, running and be lost. I will go on the deepest trail and I will just be there. And, you know, it's like that, that excitement and fear, right? I'm going into the furthest trail. There is no one there. I'm getting tired. I have no water. You have that fear, but you have that excitement that you have the power to push yourself to where you're not comfortable with, right? And, you know, to me, that's, I, I'm always inspired by nature and being like out there and people are like, why don't you worry about bears or snakes or mountain lions? I'm like, it, it just, it feeds you. It's like, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to, it's, it's very personal in a way, but I, you know, for me, when I climb a mountain and I see the top and the weather's getting bad, it's like it's that spiritual uh, challenge is like, can I do it? Should I go for it? Will I regret it if I go for it? And, uh, and you know, it's, it's all those things. And that's, that's always, you know, it's very spiritual experience every time. And that's, you know, that's, uh, that's why I love wine and sharing with friends because it's all about bouncing idea from each other. It's about learning. Uh, you know, we have a brain. It needs to be activated. We need to be a sponge. We need to learn. We not, you know, one of the movies that I absolutely love and I think was one of the greatest kids movie I ever made was Wardy and in Wardy you see the human people just completely give up on mobility on anything and suddenly AI you know machine takes over and I'm like well, yeah like feed your brain you are a plant right go outside um, discover new stuff and and interact and 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 be open right be open-minded because if you close mind and you look at a screen telling you everything you should just express or feel and you eat the same food with low nutrients and not good vitamins on like like don't take a pill for your vitamins it does not work that way eat an orange i mean yes the vitamin c numbers on the pill is very it's a marketing tool that vitamin c is just getting flushed out or even worse you you have too much and then it doesn't so it's all it's a balance right so um, and, you know, in Star Wars, for example, you can spend hours reading after the movie. So you are in front of a screen, passive, and taking a story. But really, um, the beauty of those movies is that you, you can start reading and actually getting into the storyline. Then sharing with your friend, creating a community. That movie is art in that matter because it creates a reaction and it creates a debate, right? And it creates, uh, and that's what's beautiful. When now you watch, uh, I don't know a bad superior movie with no backbone stories and well, you're becoming very passive and it's just basically a quick sugar fix in a way, right? So you are my new favorite person. <laughs> um, I, uh, I do a live stream every Saturday at five. So I just want okay. to announce that um, this Saturday I'm doing these two. Okay, so excellent. 5 p.m. Eastern is when I'm going to do these two and, and I will report back at... Um, I'm going to be in a much better space and I'm going to reevaluate this and, and I will let you know. Here um, we go. And um, yeah. Is there go anything on. else? I don't want to go on for too long because I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. But so, Yeah. My Chardonnay best pair with a bowl of popcorn. And what's beautiful about popcorn is you can put truffle oil as much of caramel, right? Whatever you want. Whatever you want. With episode one on Star Wars when you watch that uh, race pod. Uh, right? Because at the end of the day, that's one of the most exciting and cool, uh, cool, uh, you know, I think the, the number one. So it's like you never want to like one, two, and three. But if you look at number one back, it was actually a, a great, you know, Chardonnay friendly. Uh, so try that. Tell me your back on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I will put all the, the uh, pertinent links. Yeah. or Atlas and all that in the description. And I will stop recording now. Just give me one sec because I want to thank you again. But everyone, YouTube, thank you very much. Bye-bye.